Ladies and gentlemen, this is TVP World. You're watching another edition of Press Corner, where we round up the most important headlines of the week and then go into an in-depth discussion with my fellow journalists, media personality, as well as our esteemed guests. So without further ado, today we got a very, very great lineup for you guys. So first of all, we have here on my right, Mr. Yatsik Zakowski, a very proliferative uh, columnist, as well as on my left, Adam Brokowski from International Relation and Analyst Akiv Post and Dmitry Miskevich, political scientist from the Kiev Independent. Thank you guys for joining me here in the press corner. Thank you. Thank you. So before we deep dive into this issue, let's talk about the first agenda on the itinerary. We're talking about uh, the foreign minister outlining the foreign policy going forward for 2024. So let's first take a look at the footage and what he had to say. Poland's new foreign policy for the coming years is slowly taking shape. Earlier this week, the head of the foreign ministry, Radosław Sikorski, presented the four main goals of Polish foreign policy in 2024, while criticizing what we've known until now. Let's be honest. The last eight years of Polish foreign policy were a series of poor ideas, misguided assumptions and negligence. The first goal aims to ensure Poland's security by continuing to provide comprehensive support to Ukraine in its fight against Russia, while strengthening ties in both the EU bloc of 27 countries, as well as the NATO military alliance. The transatlantic alliance remains the foundation of Poland's safety. With the U.S. assuming the leadership role, we aim to continue and strengthen the American presence in Europe, but also to strengthen Europe's position in the alliance. Sikorski also assured that Poland would maintain the EU's full support for Ukraine's independence and its efforts on the road to membership in the community. At the same time, he said that the government would look after Poland's interests while also assisting Kyiv. And without further ado, let's take a deep dive into this topic of discussion. And now, first, we know, know that the foreign policy going forward will be focusing on a strength through diplomacy as well as integration into the European Union. And Mr. Yaza, can you help us understand this a new approach of the Polish foreign policy of an integration with the European Union? Well, uh, previous government uh, was not very much fond of uh, European Union, especially Germany. That was a problem uh, for Polish politics. And uh, what uh, Sikorski said is that we don't have to choose between the US and the EU, and uh, we, can, uh, we can proliferate, we can make stronger, even stronger relations with both sides of, uh, of the Atlantic. Uh, that's absolutely crucial, especially when we have uh, uh, a close future, uh, elections in the US and possible change uh, in the White House. So uh, what he said was, well, we must keep the strong relations with the US apart from who will uh, win the election. Uh, this is important because for a democratic uh, government in Poland, the new, the new government, uh, Donald Trump is, of course, a problem. This is an issue. But we can solve it, <laughs> said Sikorski. This is important. Right. And like uh, Jacek has mentioned, the foreign minister is uh, believed that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Pursuing European policy does not mean uh, disconnecting from America altogether. And we can see in some of our articles here, uh, for example, the Washington Post saying that Poland lays claim to a leadership role in Europe as Russia's war threatened uh, stability. Uh, do you think this is uh, overly ambitious or do you think there's some validity to it, uh, Mr. Adam? Well, when you look at the Kiev Post article, that's uh, interesting in itself because uh, it was very well received in Ukraine, right? So this just points the right direction of Sikorsky's foreign policy. I don't believe that's overly ambitious. It's pragmatic. It's what's necessary to counter the Russian threat. Whether we like it or not, we need to 
do it. And um, given what was happening before with the previous government, it's vital to show that the new government understands the mistakes, but it doesn't just mindlessly criticize what happened. It learns from it and it develops based on that what happened, right? Uh, so the direction is good. The direction is uh, there is the right direction. The question is whether we can keep that direction, right? Because right. of course there is a lot of uh, obstacles, a lot of hindrance. Uh, so that's the vital, vital question here. But I believe with uh, Mr. Sikorsky's experience and contacts around the planet, um, we are on the right track and it doesn't seem that, you know, we are going to lose uh, our focus. Right, definitely a very positive message here. And uh, Dimitri, speaking of uh, taking a leadership role, we also know that Mr. Sikorsky talked about helping independence movement in Belarus. So since you're from Belsat, I would like to uh, pick your brain on that. How can that be achieved and how can Poland take their leadership role in helping the independence movement inside places like Belarus and Russia? Uh, the point is that you know this uh, talk of role of Poland as the main like you know gatekeeper at this eastern flank of NATO uh, is uh, lasting you know for already a couple of years. So uh, we see that Poland has taken the role of leader in this region, and uh, we see that there is uh, close cooperation with uh, Belarusian forces. You know, with uh, people who work for uh, Belarusian independence, uh, for example, with the office of Svetlana Tikhanovska, there are different programs. We also hope that the uh, countering Russian and Lukashenko regime propaganda in our countries will be enforced as well with the help of, of course, uh, with the help of Belsat and TVP World and that uh, the work in this direction will continue because as we see that even inside of Russia people need this information and for example, you know, if we're here like in press corner and speaking about this media things as well, uh, we get very interesting statistics that for example, a bigger part of uh, our audience who are watching our Russian uh, language TV, Vottak, uh, this is the bigger part of this audience, is inside Russia, the main part, and uh, a part of this audience, around 60%, is at the same time watching not only our TV channel, but Russia 24. So this means that we are not like working with the same audience all the time, but with the people that also have, you know, like normal democratic views and so on and so forth, but with the people who are like, you know, looking for information, which is extremely important in this time, because what we see that Russia is really uh, working very hard in this propaganda thing. So, uh, you know, here in Poland, it is very easy to work with that because, you know, we know the mentality of Russians. So here we have people from Belarus, from Ukraine and from Russia as well, who can work on that. So this is the role of Poland to accumulate these forces and to work on that. This is the way of taking this very leadership and working in this direction because this will also have clear results because it is easy to understand that you know Poland is really the first country interested in normal situation in Belarus and in Ukraine and in Russia as well so this is like the direct interest of uh, Poland and uh, of our countries of you know this broader region so that's quite simple so I suppose that this is quite natural thing for a Polish foreign ministry and you know for Polish government right. to think like that Definitely, it sounds like the battle is not just on the front line, but also on the information sphere. And speaking of propaganda, we do have a piece in key post here saying that Lviv is Ukraine and Warsaw assure it has no territory claims to Ukraine. And so I would like to direct a question to Jacek here. Why do you think uh, the foreign minister find it necessary to clarify a position perhaps the rest of the world already know? And do you think that uh, this <coughs> Russian propaganda stating that uh, Russia somehow has any claim to Ukraine or Poland wants to have any claim in Ukraine is more internal propaganda or uh, why is that information out there even? Well, this is absolutely propaganda. Uh, nobody in Poland, nobody serious at least in Poland claim, has any claims uh, against uh, Ukraine. Uh, apart from that, we used to live in one state for centuries. This is important. But this was not, not just a Polish state. We understand this. This was also Ukrainian state, Belarusian state, Lit Lithuanian state. And so, uh, f and for Poles, it seems to be obvious, uh, but not for Russians. For Russians, this was Poland, because Poland is a symbolic entity for uh, this ideological position of Putin and Dugin and uh, all Russian, many Russian intellectuals creating the false 
picture of history uh, uh, based on the hate to the West. Danger West. Danger comes from West and West means Poland. So uh, when Sikorski says, don't worry, we have no claims, not, no territorial claims. This is extremely important also for Russians if they hear it, and I hope they do. Yeah, and by the way, this is a very interesting thing that uh, you're talking about, because uh, recently, uh, maybe three, year, uh, three days ago, a uh, very famous Russian writer, uh, Zahar Prilepin, wrote uh, an article uh, in his Telegram channel about necessity of Russia to finally choose the very single identity and to make a red flag, a red, a red communist flag, the main national symbol. So they're talking about this as, you know, as their main idea. So they tell that we need one national idea that will, like, you know, get together, bring together all, like, entities in Russia, mm -hmm. and that this communist idea, this red flag, should be our, like, main direction, and we should make it the main symbol. So they're basing their ideology on that, mm -hmm. which, which is very interesting because... Uh, you know, in Russia, there are these, like, two directions, because some of them, some of uh, Russian ideologists, uh, like Russian Empire, and they, you know, like, uh, try to spread this kind of ideology. And now, uh, which, by the way, Putin is in favor, because even Putin uh, made, uh, opened uh, a monument to uh, Russian generals, white generals who fought against communists, which is very interesting. But now, uh, a big part of Russian establishment wants to make this kind of uh, Eurasian communist ideology the mainstream. All right, and we do see a little projection here. While they're trying to expand their territory, they're accusing Poland of doing so. But like Yasek here said, nobody in here is really buying it. So I think your assessment could be correct that the foreign minister might be just shouting out to Russia there and telling them we do not have any And to the West, and to the West, yeah. to not to let be influenced I may just, uh, by Russian propaganda. Add something here. Uh, Vladimir Putin wrote an article on historical unity of Ukrainians and Russians, basically and he mentions Poland 29 times in that article because I like you know, analyzing uh, lang linguistically what, what, what's said, what's written. And uh, so that to me points to his fixation and obsession. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it's quite um, you know, common knowledge that he views Poland essentially not as a real state as well. So uh, we need to bear that in mind, right? Definitely. Because uh, I actually use one, in my, my articles, I use the word Duginesque, mm -hmm. because you know that some people just have this vision, this image of uh, you know, Poland trying to grab some Ukrainian lands, which of course is preposterous. There is no interest in that whatsoever, apart from really fringe, uh, deranged individuals who are interested in that, but of course that's never going to materialize because their influence in foreign policy is zero. Right, so uh, fortunately for us. So uh, Russians, of course, are capitalizing on this. I believe that the propagandists, they know exactly what they're doing. They know that they're spouting nonsense, but of course they're paid for it to do it. Some probably believe their own propaganda, but mostly I'd say that they know exactly what they're doing. But the problem is that many people in the world, you know, who are either, as they call, deluded or just dumb or, you know, they're paid, mm -hmm. um, they, don't, they don't understand it, right? Well, they're paid, they're paid, they understand it, but others, they do not understand it, and they see Russia as this... Uh, romanticized place right. and that's the problem because uh, they are the ones that this propaganda is targeting and unfortunately quite a few of them are present in the uh, US political class. So. Right and speaking of the United States you also talk about this message perhaps shouting out to the West. This brings us to the next topic. Uh, President Joe Biden has finally signed off on this 61 billion aid package to Ukraine. Of course it has passed not without its hurdles and we will be diving into this topic next so let's take a look for a report. A months-long legislative impasse in Washington came to an end earlier this week after President Joe Biden signed a $94 billion foreign funding bill into law. In addition to aid for Israel and Taiwan, funds from the bill include some long-awaited help for Ukraine. And now America is going to send Ukraine the supplies they need to keep them in the fight. This weekend, the reports, and this is, I find this amazing, the reports of cheers breaking out of the trenches in eastern Ukraine. Probably came from one of your folks, a reporter or someone. I'm not sure where it came from. But that they're cheering as they watch the House vote and support for Ukraine. It's not like they don't understand what we've done. 
And I'd like to understand how critical this is for them. I'm making sure the shipments start right away. In the next few hours, literally the few hours, we're, we're going to begin sending in equipment to uh, Ukraine for air defense munitions, for artillery, for rocket systems and armored vehicles. The fact that Biden managed to push the aid package through Congress with bipartisan support is a victory for the incumbent president who is seeking re-election this fall. But this is primarily a victory for the Ukrainians. We've been working as hard as possible with our American friends, at all levels, to quickly fill the package from the United States with exactly the kind of weapons that our soldiers need. The Ukraine bill includes $23 billion to make up for the shortfall in the U.S. arsenal caused by the donation of equipment to Ukraine, nearly $14 billion to purchase equipment for Ukraine, and over $11 billion to maintain U.S. forces in the region. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. The passing of the bill was also supported by Americans gathering just outside the White House. Seems like it's a battle of... Uh... Um, good versus evil, and I, I can't believe it's taken this long. It's great to see we're finally making some progress in helping out the Ukrainians. The first shipments to Ukraine were made just hours after Biden signed the bill on Wednesday. So as we just saw there, the world breathed a sigh of relief when Joe Biden finally signed the dotted line. And as the president has stated, these equipment will be shipping to Ukraine before the ink even dries. Now the question is, will this be enough? Will this be uh, soon enough or perhaps a little bit too late? At least this will be necessary to stop Russian offense uh, now in Donbas because we know that uh, Russians try to break the front line. So we see that they're ready to make a big offensive there. They also gathered uh, their troops near Kharkiv. So this is another direction of uh, possible Russian offense. So uh, I suppose that this is, uh, you know, the main thing here is about uh, these missiles that uh, could really help to break down this Russian offense because this will break down Russian logistic systems, which is the main thing about this war as well, because, you know, uh, this uh, already the presence of some long range missiles uh, already broke some Russian plans. So we see that these can help Ukraine to at least stop this Russian offense. Then we also should look at what happens next, because we see that uh, Russia's like, you know, Russia's troops and Russia's force, of course, are bigger. But uh, technologically, Ukraine can advance. So this is, you know, we cannot say that this will be like the treat for all Ukrainian problems and for all the things that are happening on the front line. But still, we see that this is very important right now. And uh, this is also the sign for Putin that Ukraine won't be left alone because uh, his plan is like basically to make everyone refuse from supporting Ukraine because of inner problems, because of other problems on the other fronts and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's why Russia tries to make hybrid attacks on the West. Because in their mentality, they're already fighting with the West. They're waging war with the West, not with Ukraine. They underline it, even in their like internal communicates. They write it that they wage war with the West on the territory of Ukraine. Mm. And making this war, like even in different dimensions and in different continents, uh, making the West suffer from Russian attacks, for example, in Africa, so they try to influence uh, the Western world with different means, not only with uh, directly military threat. So that's the point. And uh, this uh, sign of uh, supporting Ukraine is very important right now to say that we are still consolidated, that we are helping Ukraine and that we are ready to fight which is really important not only as the direct aid, of right. course, to help stop Russian offense, mm -hmm. but to show that this is uh, war and that we are united. So. Right. That's a very good point that you brought up here. And I would like to also turn this question to Mr. Yasek here, whether you're a glass half empty or half full <laughs> kind of person, because we did see this being passed with uh, bipartisan support. However, when we look at the number, it is not as overwhelming of a support as those to Israel or to Taiwan, for example. Do you think that this actually shows bipartisan strength or do you think that maybe there's a chink in the armor and we might see what they call war fatigue kicking? You know, we are, you, the U.S. are in an election year. So uh, 
we shouldn't uh, uh, be so uh, so much interested in how the vote looks. We should look at how it probably will look after the election because the war will uh, be continued. And uh, I strongly believe that uh, after elections, Americans, including uh, Donald Trump, will be more pro-Ukrainian than they are now. Uh, there are many, many reasons. But what is important, in, in my opinion, is that this vote uh, encouraged other states to support Ukraine even more. Look at Spaniards, for example. They are sending half of their patriots yeah. to Ukraine. They would not do it if not, not the vote in, uh, in the US. And other countries will follow. So this is really substantial, not because it provides uh, enough support, but because it creates a situation in which enough support will appear. Right, so it's like uh, opening up the faucet. Like you mentioned, we do see uh, the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak also announced very shortly after half a billion pound, which is one of the largest military support to Ukraine. So do you also share this like positive sentiment about this perhaps being the thing that opens up the gateway, especially taking into consideration that US finally approved the long range attack to Ukraine? Do you think this might be a sign that the allies are ready to help with even more advanced tech? Yes, it could be a sign, and Russian propaganda is, of course, aghast at, you know, at the uh, new systems. Of course, they are pointing, they were showing how much of Russia can be directly targeted. And uh, to me, it is preposterous, it is absurd that uh, Ukraine cannot target Russia directly because, you know, refineries, because of all this, uh, you know, talk, I think, you know, it makes no sense. I understand the reasoning that is trying to be presented in the U.S. and other mm -hmm. uh, countries, but, you know, when you want to win the war, you can't just, uh, you know, you can't let um, not to be not to enemy targeted, right? You need to target the enemy, right? That, that's, exactly. that's crucial. So, um, but again, when you look at uh, optimism aside, when you look at Kharkiv, the TV tower was struck, yeah. for example, and of course, missiles keep coming, uh, you know, they are, keep draining down on Ukraine. So yes, there is optimism, but there is also a lot to be done. And, you know, we're gonna have to see where this goes, but um, uh, we can't just be blinded by optimism. Mm. We can't just be blinded by optimism because the situation on the ground is unpredictable. And as I always say, with Russia, you can expect everything, you know, unfortunately. And I think that nothing can be taken off the table, unfortunately, with, with Russia, and we need to bear that in mind. So um, optimism, yes, mm -hmm. but always remember who you're dealing with. That, you know, you can't just uh, ignore them, you can't just uh, trivialize them because they are capable of anything. And we need to bear that in mind. But it doesn't mean that we must be afraid. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that at the same time. Right. Uh, Dimitri, Adam brought up a very good point about uh, maybe perhaps this is also a sign that the uh, U.S. and the Western allies are noticing that prohibiting Ukraine from hitting inside the Russian territory or this arbitrary line is essentially asking them to fight a freight train with hands tied behind their backs. Do you think also the approval of the attack and missile maybe even though rhetorically the U.S. says do not hit behind the lines, but sending them weapons with the capability to do so is a sign that maybe these Western allies are letting their hands off a little bit to let Ukrainians decide how they want to fight this war? I suppose that, you know, it's also uh, the uh, issue of uh, politics and not the direct military things because uh, it's very interesting to see the reaction of the United States and, uh, for example, on the usage of these weapons because I don't think that, you know, they will be very loud about, uh, for example, Ukrainian attacks and Russian infrastructure or something like that mm -hmm. because we live in the times when, you know, uh, different sides, sides speak different things and, of course, Russian will tell that, you know, Ukrainians used some American super weapon to hit our, like, refinery or something like that, or our stock of ammunition. But Ukraine will say that, you know, it's a Ukrainian-made drone. Our, uh, my friend Mikola made it on his backyard, and this, you know, can hit any Russian object in uh, thousands of kilometers. And, you know, the point is that nobody can prove nothing, you know, in this kind of situation. So I suppose that this will be, you know, the issue also of appreciation that. Uh, I don't think that uh, United States will be really happy about uh, Ukraine hitting something, you know, very important <laughs> or with a big civilian uh, number of uh, victims, but 
I don't think that they will be extremely against hitting Russian critical infrastructure like refineries or like uh, military industry objects or something like that because we already know about this kind of attacks. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, on the attacks of uh, the plant where this uh, Russian AVEX uh, uh, airplanes are assembled. Mm -hmm. So these kind of objects are the main targets for Ukraine as well as this uh, objects of uh, supply like big stocks and so on and so forth. Forth. So this is uh, the main thing and I don't believe that this will be like a big issue and you know the United States will be saying that we like are against uh, you know doing something in Russian territory because we already see that Ukraine possesses some weapons to hit objects on Russian territory. They're doing this successfully. So it will be unprovable you know basically to say that directly this American weapon was used. All right. Thank you so much. And speaking of the situation in the front line, we do know that war is not just fought with equipment and bullets, but most importantly, war is one with soldiers. And unfortunately, we do see problems that may soon arise for Ukrainians of draft age who left the country. And as we have the new mobilization law that leads to Ukraine's partner, including Poland, to consider mobilizing the Ukrainian citizens. Let's first take a look at a report to see the situation. Ukraine is stepping up the pressure on its citizens who have fled the country after Russia's invasion in early 2022. Now, consular services abroad could be temporarily suspended for those who refuse to respond to mobilization notices. Without passports, they will not be able to make most banking arrangements or renew their residence cards. Many people are hesitating and don't want to sign anything with the government. There is no trust, objectively and subjectively. There isn't any. Head of Ukrainian diplomacy Dmitry Kuleva explaining his ministry's decision said that the priority is to defend the country from Russian destruction. Poland has expressed its support. This will not change how we treat, approach or support Ukrainian citizens in Poland. Nevertheless, we completely respect the decision made by the Ukrainian authorities. Poland is not the only country considering mobilizing Ukrainian citizens residing abroad. Thursday's statement by the Lithuanian defense minister confirms that Lithuanians would also be willing to follow in Poland's footsteps. The idea of increasing mobilization in Ukraine emerged late last year. Initially, authorities said that up to 500,000 new people could be drafted into the army. Nonetheless, the new mobilization law will take effect in the second half of May. So as we know recently, Poland's consulate from Ukraine has already stopped uh, cooperating with Ukrainian citizens when it comes to uh, helping them with documents and such. And we do see that the mobilization is perhaps in progress. So uh, I would like to address this to Jacek because I personally have very mixed feeling about this. On one hand, I do know that Ukraine sure. needs more soldiers on the front line. The guys in the front need to rotate out, right? But at the same time, it is very gut-wrenching, isn't it? Well, this is an extremely difficult situation for us because, uh, well, on one side we uh, heavily support Ukraine uh, and we understand this, that uh, existing of Ukrainian state is crucial for existing of Polish state and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, now Ukrainian uh, government creates a situation in which we are expected to hunt for Ukrainian, young, young Ukrainian males on Polish streets. It's impossible uh, in pora, uh, po Polish moral standards, mm. say. But it's also impossible to say no to, to Zelensky. Mm. Uh, so I, I'm very curious what will Polish government, uh, what will Polish government uh, do? And I, I asked, uh, like before yesterday, uh, a, a Polish minister of higher education, what about uh, student, Ukrainian students in, in Poland? And he said, I have no idea. We must think about it. And it will take months to think about it to, uh, and to come to any kind of considerations. And we will not be as quick as the Germans who said they will not send the Ukrainians back to Ukraine. Uh, we will probably not say that, but we will not do that, I believe. 
Right, and of course we do see some publication from like the Financial Times, Poland and Lithuania to help Ukraine repatriate men of fighting age, or from a very good publication called TVP World, saying that Lithuania is also following Poland's lead when it comes to repatriating these men. But I think I think uh, yeah, like they used a very uh, kind of strong term because it essentially is hunting down Ukrainian men and sending them back to the front lines. How do you guys feel about it, um, Adam? Well, I have mixed feelings as well because I understand the situation. At the same time, personally, I'm against any kind of, you know, forcing anyone to that kind of fight. But, um, yeah, it's, um, you know, there is President Zelensky, there is the Ukrainian government, there are the Ukrainians. How do you reconcile it to in a situation like that, right? How do you diplomatically reconcile it to? I don't think there is a, an easy answer to that. And unfortunately, as this war progresses, no matter in which direction, there probably are going to be more and more issues like that, unexpected issues that we're going to have to address mm -hmm. as Poland, as the EU, or even as the world, depending right. on how it you know, progresses. Let's hope it progresses in the right direction, right? Uh, let's hope that uh, Russia is not going to um, eventually get their chance, you know, to say invade Kiev and so on, right? Let's hope that's not going to happen. Yeah. But we need to be prepared for any scenario. So. Um, you know, when you look at the uh, pictures, right, of Ukrainian, desperate Ukrainian men mm -hmm. who are, you know, trying to stay in Poland, in Warsaw, for example, um, that tells you a lot. Yeah. That tells you a lot, and it's heartbreaking. And, you know, it's, um, it's easy to talk about it, it's easy to judge. I don't think we are in that kind of position, actually, yeah. because we are not in that situation. So, yes, uh, it's easy, you know, Russian propaganda, of course, they did accuse Ukrainian men of cowardice in the past, you know, that there are some Ukrainian men who are disguised as women, you know, they're trying to flee, you know, to the West, but that's, of course, that's nonsense, right? But that's what Russian propaganda, of course, is going to pick this up, no doubt, right. and they are going to use it. The question is whether, how many people are going to buy into their version of events. But for now, I think we need to find some kind of consensus, mm -hmm. if it's even possible. Well, I just don't think um, we are in the position, as I said, to judge, mm -hmm. to pontificate, because we are outsiders, essentially. Of course. Um, so I'm not really, you know, I don't really want to, uh, uh, you know, pontificate and judge here. Mm -hmm. I think it's up to the uh, Ukrainians and up to our government what to do with this, of course, and the Ukrainian government. Well. Yeah, definitely a very tough position to be very in. Uh, Mr. Dmitry, I would actually like to also ask you this question because we do see that back in year 2023, when polled, Ukrainians overwhelmingly, like 94 to 97% view Poland favorably. And during this year, because of the farmer blockade, that number has already dropped to 57%. Do you think with the Poland's participation of this conscription, there will be a further deterioration between the Ukrainian populace and uh, the people here in Poland? First of all, we should speak about Russian propaganda work here in this direction. Russian propaganda is still strong in Ukraine. It's still working quite okay. So they're using really uh, sophisticated uh, technologies in this field. So I would say that they are really, you know, specially make this kind of, uh, uh, you know, negative attitude of Ukrainians towards uh, Poland and towards the Poles. At the same time, we see that the Ukrainian establishment, let's, you know, speak like we're yeah, in press corner so we can, you know, be speak open here, that the right. Ukrainian establishment is doing everything to be appreciated negatively in the eyes of the Western people. Mm. So they're doing everything possible. For example, when a Ukrainian economic minister uh, writes uh, on Twitter, uh, writes a post mocking of the uh, motto of the uprising of 1863 so I don't think that you know it's a wise, a wise thing to do you know and uh, it of course it was definitely negatively appreciated in Poland and by Belarusians as well I personally made a program about these things talking about the appreciation of uh, Ukrainian diplomacy in the West and how these people are working with the uh, with the, their neighbors with Belarusians with the Poles and really, even the right Ukrainians that are telling that this is a big problem. So this problem has, you know, like two directions, two dimensions, yeah? And I would say that uh, we should work, like, together mm -hmm. uh, to overcome this gap. And of course, you know, this uh, decision to repatriate Ukrainian men will um, cause, like, uh, negative reactions uh, within a part of Ukrainian society. But, you know, let's, like, just ask a couple of questions. How did this man get out of the country 
when it's prohibited. Right. So this is corruption. You know, so this is already committing a crime. Yeah. And at the same time, we also come to the other issue. You know, it's like a weakness of democracy. Because in Ukraine, we see that, you know, some mother comes to this military commissariat and is talking that, you know, you won't take my son. And she's shouting and yelling at the soldiers who are standing here, you know, and who are uh, trying to tell her that, you know, it's like our obligation. So, you know, it's mobilization. Right, so that's we someone do else's that. son too, right? That's yeah, right there. but at the same time, you know, in Russia, we have no such problems. Because if some mother comes to military commissariat and starts yelling at somebody, she gets punched in the face and, you know, and this is the end of the story. Yeah. You know, because in Russia it's like impossible, you know, they, yeah. and here we see that this is uh, now, this is like a, you know, existential issue, you know, how the, the system works. So how do we work, Ukrainian system uh, works effectively? Right. And we see that, you know, there are these political problems. We see that there is this problem of, um, uh, you know, like th with this mobilization. Because what is the main argument of uh, Ukrainians who don't want to be mobilized? Let the son of Kuleba or Kuleba himself go to the, goes to the front line and fights. You know, so this is also, we cannot like uh, discuss this uh, issue in this kind of direction because it's you know it's nonsense right. but other, this is present and the other problem is ukraine is not an ideal state yeah and we must love it and support it as it is not as you'd like it to be yeah. and this is very popular on the west people say well we will support ukraine it will get better if you wait you wait until corruption is over. You know, it takes centuries. Right. <laughs> yes, Ukraine will, would not exist. So uh, this is what we need to, especially in face of uh, Russian uh, propaganda. Uh, it's something we must repeat. That there is only one Ukraine. It's not perfect. We must support it to survive and to, to get better. And it creates a different, uh, dif different uh, uh, situation when we debate with our Western friends, uh, mentioning corruption on Ukraine, we send money and they're corrupted and so on and so on. That's the truth. Yeah. It will not change in a week. Right, it's a more pragmatic yet a more realistic view of things and with an open and honest discussion, maybe we will be able to reach a more constructive uh, response. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's like, you know, saying Ukraine will win, Ukraine will win, that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. But you can't just be blind optimism. That's, right. you know, as in reference to the previous point. Very that's exactly so. what this is. Mm -hmm. And, of course, when you mention some negati negative points, some people get upset. Right. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Because they want perfection here and now. They don't understand that there are flaws. Right. And it's natural. Corruption is a flaw and it's there. Right. And you can't just ignore it. It'll be there. You have to accept it. You know, we can't just hope it's going to go away, magical thinking. Yeah, definitely something that had to be dealt with in the future. Meanwhile, we do have a little bit of time left, and I would like to dive into another uh, hard topic. That is the current situation in Israel. Before we talk more about it, let's first take a look at our material. After stalling several weeks ago, truce talks between Israel and Hamas appear likely to resume in the near future. The negotiations, mediated by Egypt, have been praised for being focused and in good spirits. The signs of renewed truce talks come as the UN warned that famine thresholds in Gaza would be breached within the next six weeks unless massive food assistance arrives. Aid groups say that Gaza's already catastrophic humanitarian conditions could be worsened by an invasion that Israel has vowed to carry out against Hamas battalions that remain in Rafah. Now Hamas leaders are optimistic that a two-state, stable peace deal can be worked out. Hamas's disbanding of its military wing would be among the provisions. However, Israel has voiced concern about an impasse and threatened an offensive in Rafah if a satisfactory agreement is not reached. At the moment, the city bordering Egypt is crowded with hundreds of thousands of Palestinians displaced by nearly seven months of war between Israel and Hamas. The area is regularly bombed. Hospital officials said strikes in Rafah and elsewhere killed more than 12 people overnight. 
Egypt, Qatar and the U.S. have been trying unsuccessfully to seal a new truce deal in Gaza ever since a one-week halt in fighting in November, when 80 Israeli hostages were exchanged for 240 Palestinians held in Israeli prisons. As talks drag on, dozens of people in Gaza die every day, according to figures from the health ministry in the Hamas-run territory. Of course, another very polarizing topic here. I'm not giving you guys any easy time right here in this corner, <laughs> but you guys are all professionals, so I trust that we can do this. And Yatsik, I would like to go back to what we were talking about, having like a pragmatic and realistic look at the situation. And I think you brought up a very good point about how that could possibly lead us down the road of solution. Do you think there's a good chance that this new peace deal could materialize? Or do you think maybe that in it itself is a little bit too optimistic? I'm afraid it's too optimistic because there are so many powers, big powers, interested in mass in the Middle East and in Israel especially. Uh, mention Iran, China, Saudi Arabia, uh, Russia. Uh, they are all, they have all very deep, serious interests to uh, destroy, uh, destroy Israel but by itself to make Israel destroy itself. And unfortunately, the Israeli government is following this way. So uh, what we see is that the West uh, trying to support uh, Israel uh, meets in the Israel many obstacles created uh, in intensively by the government. So well, what can we do? We can send some humanitarian aid, we can send some uh, more missiles to let Israel defend against Iran, but it will not change the situation. Mm. So uh, I'm pessimist. I, I think it, it will take years. And I'm not sure we will win. Right. It does sound like a very difficult situation. And like Yacek just said here, I think a lot of our article here actually echoes the same sentiment. Uh, this one in journalism post says, pro-Israel, anti-Netanyahu, how American Jews are reshaping Zionism. Now, a lot of it in the article talks about, like Essek just said, maybe these uh, people who have interest in seeing Israel self-implode. Do you think that the Netanyahu government is facilitating that self-implosion? You know, it's a very difficult question because it's also, you know, like, also like Ukraine a little bit. Because mm -hmm. also, you know, Israeli government is sometimes doing everything to be appreciated negatively. So take the story with these volunteers being killed and the reaction of Israeli ambassador here in Poland. Okay. It was like, you know, nobody could understood how this can happen. If this is diplomacy, then, you know, I cannot imagine what is happening there in, you know, with their other politicians. So if this is a diplomatic behavior. so. Uh, it's also the issue of appreciation. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, we also live in very interesting world when the ideas, you know, get really uh, like showed very in completely very interesting way. For example, like you know, we also saw, uh, for example, U uh, European extreme left supporting uh, Palestine right. and supporting Hamas. You know, the, the, this was. Like when I saw this uh, famous picture of uh, uh, queers for Palestine, it's it like was like, you know... Chicken for uh, KFC. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> chicken for KFC, oh, something like that. Yeah, it was like, you know, completely not understandable. And we see that it's really very difficult now to convince somebody to uh, take any part in this kind of war because of these uh, ideological things. And uh, also this behavior of uh, Israeli government is not the best one, as I mentioned previously. So I don't think that they will succeed in uh, making peace there, you know, at least some stable peace. Because uh, as previously Yatsik said that, you know, there were man too many forces involved. Mm -hmm. But maybe, maybe this kind of situation will finally influence Israeli uh, society and their politicians that they will finally understand that in this kind of situation in the world, mm -hmm. they have to adjust to some uh, priorities and to some values that are, uh, you know, that are applied in the countries that support them. 
Right. So because if we see that, you know, the democratic world uh, is supporting Israel, so maybe this will be the same issue like with Ukrainian corruption that, of course, you know, these values won't change in a moment, mm -hmm. but maybe there will be at least some movement towards them. At least we'll see that, you know, the, this uh, like human rights and so on and so forth will not only be declared, but also will be followed there, right. and that there will be a chance of changing the very approach to the policy, very because well uh, this also the approach to making like allies and mm -hmm. also Israeli supporting, for example, Ukraine, right. and supporting changes in other parts of the world. Like I said, value is something that we must hold, and this is what's going to be permeating through all these discussions, be it Ukraine, be it Israel. Thank you so much, guys, for your input and insight. Really appreciate it. What a wonderful discussion. And guys, thank you for watching. This has been Press Corner. But for more news, update, and commentary, please stay tuned to TVP World.